do is try and well, firstly find out how many uh, patients are involved. These multi-car accidents often have patients with serious injuries. We need to try and work out where are the patients in relation to the crash. All right. Car versus car, approximately yeah. about 45 mile an hour total impact. Yeah. Um, three other people walked away. This guy here apparently has been unconscious. Okay. Uh, for about the last 25 minutes. All right. When you open his eyes, if they're just if it was a roll back to his okay. uh, All right. Back. All right. There's supposedly three other working wounded. If I have a quick look here, will you just yeah, okay. eyeball the other three? The local ambulance team is also on site and have stabilised the patient. Are you are you needing the extrication? Yeah. Can I just have a? Is he actually trapped? He's got he's got these legs are trapped. Okay. Um, just checking. Do you, yeah. Do you mind if I just have a look at him? Hi, fella. How are you? Are you all right? The driver no? is a university student, 25-year-old Jerome. He was heading home from college at the time of the crash. Hello, fella. He feels really warm. He's not cold and clammy. When I move his arm, he actually has tone in his arm. When I open his eyes, they don't feel flaccid. Have the seatbelt pretension has worked? Has the patient been protected? This airbag's gone off, and that airbag's gone off. So he's got a good radial and everything. Yeah. We'll just take all this away. Yeah, It'll speed right. it up, OK? Let's just get this oxygen mask on it. The patient is not responding. He's not responding to painful stimuli or verbal stimuli which technically is unconscious, but I think he's slightly not quite that unconscious. He's more frightened than scared. That's why his eyes are closed and he's not talking to us. But anyway, we're going to get him out of the car in a controlled way um, so we don't damage his spine, and then we're going to have another look at him. Do you think the seat will move or not? OK. So look, we'll just go for a simple... Right, so who's leading? So you're, you're leading, are you? OK. It's very difficult when patients are not talking to you they're not speaking, they're not moving their eyes, and they're not moving. Technically, that's a low Glasgow Coma score, three, which is profoundly unconscious. But he had tone in his face. When I tried to look in his eyes, there was a little bit of resistance to lifting his eyelids. All of those suggest to me that he actually is more aware uh, than he's letting on. This guy is... Yeah, it's uh, a bit odd, isn't it? He, um, He's not GCS3. Um, he's, he's lighter than that. Uh, his blood pressure's normal, his heart rate's normal, so he looks OK. OK, have we got the board? Board ready? Going to come out on the board. Right. Hold on, Jim. Right. Have we got the board ready? Sorry, do we, can't we just get him up and out? Yeah, we won't get him up like that. Why not? We're going to do more damage than getting up. No, no, I'm happy. Post out and take him just lift him straight up, put it over. He won't do him any harm. If he can't do this, we're just going to drag him out the side. Take me two minutes to take that post. Yeah. We'll get him out in two minutes. One, two, three. What's up? You can't lift him up. You ain't got to lift him up on there. That's right, come on, let's just get him out. Let's put him out the side. There's no reason why he shouldn't be out by now. So put, just put the board in under his bum here now. Slide it under his arm. Let's lift his bum onto there and fold him down onto his right hand side. Ready? One, two, three. Are we okay? Let's keep him in the middle for now. All right, quick as we can. Well, let's just get him skin to scoop, yeah? Do you want to take this head? We're just going to roll him. Roll. No wounds to his back. In. So there's, there's actually no external signs of trauma, is there? Anyway, I think from our point of view, this isn't life-threatening. Um, not life-threatening? No, okay. no, not at all. Not, and not life-changing either. What, what, what the extent of the injuries, please, Do you reckon at this stage? I don't, I don't think he's got any. Oh, really? Yeah. Oh, okay. so, I, I can't identify any either. At this stage, it's big, not life-threatening or life-threatening? No. 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 
Gareth is sure that Girong is well and in good hands. He tries to unearth clues as to what has happened. This car, it, it isn't uh, quite head on. There is some impact to the front of the vehicle here. Whilst it looks superficially quite bad, actually the real solid structures of the cars are not deformed in any way. But the combination of the seatbelt, the airbags, and the deformation of the vehicle at the front have helped protect them. So um, what looks like a nasty crash, actually those forces haven't been transmitted to him and I think he's, he's going to be all right. We pride ourselves in trying to find out what has happened to our patients. And it is really important to find out what's happened to your patients because when you know what's happened to them, you can predict what injuries they might have. His arms are completely normal. I think he can go to Kingston. Giraud, uninjured but clearly traumatized by the incident, is going to be taken to a local hospital to recover. He was discharged later that night. London's Air Ambulance is on call for life-threatening emergencies every day. You've been hit by a lorry. Every new patient, each new trauma scene, ah! presents a set of medical challenges. The great challenge of emergency medicine is the fact that we don't know what's coming through the door. And that's when I think a lot of emergency physicians get a real buzz. So where's your pain? Right. The doctors use their training, so expertise and their gut instinct <laughs> to spot the okay. clues. Oh, no. Work out what the problem is. Must have hit a telephone box. Their on-the-spot decisions are quite literally a matter hey. of life or death. He wouldn't survive in your social operation. Royal London. Yeah. We haven't got a trauma pack yet. At the Royal London Hospital, Dr. Anne Weaver is awaiting her next investigative challenge. We've got a call from the ambulance service to say there's a 28 year old male who's been involved in a road traffic accident. I don't know whether he's a pedestrian or what, but apparently he's got a head injury, um, an injury to his left shoulder, and is slightly down on his level of consciousness and that he's confused as far as we know. So we've got the trauma team ready and we'll see what we've got. Hello. Hello, sir. Sorry. My name's Anne. I'm one of the doctors. Are you getting me out of the first? Yeah, yeah, perfect. So, uh, he's 28. Uh, he's been hit by a car. Uh, he was in the middle of the road. Car travelling at approximately 30 miles an hour. He's hit the bonnet, hit the windscreen. No bullseye. Landed in the road. The driver's got out, helped him to the side of the road. He cannot remember anything that's happened. Um, so, query LOC. He's got about a two to three inch laceration to the back of his head. No C-spine tenderness. Um, complaining of pain in his left knee and his left shoulder. Has no memory of today, doesn't know what the date is. Very repetitive, keeps asking where he is over and over again. Great, thanks okay. very much. OK, three people either side. Mm -hmm. Ready, race, remove. Slip is closed down if they're not completely cut. Being hit by a car at 30 miles an hour, so Ab could have injuries anywhere on his body. To his lower limbs, pelvis, rib fractures, internal injuries to his liver, spleen, or his lungs. And he obviously could have a head injury or a spinal injury, so the possibilities are wide at the moment. Do you remember anything? No. Trachea central, clavicle on the left and the right are normal. No sign of bruising on the lateral chest walls. No evidence of crepitus or pain on palpation of the rib cage. He's got a good radial pulse. Yeah. It's over an hour since Soeb was Sorry. injured. Hello, how are you doing? Uh, not really good because I can't remember anything. You can't remember anything? Don't worry about not remembering. It, it's probably a sign that you have had a bang to the head and that you might have been knocked out and that you can't yeah. remember it. Well, what we've been told, partly by the driver, who I think got out to help you, I think you were crossing the road and you were hit by a car going at about 30 miles an hour. Okay. It's pretty I fast. I was crossing the road without any, like... I don't know. You don't remember that at all? No, I don't. 
Don't worry. Okay, it might come back to you. Okay. This forgetfulness is a clear clue for Anne. One of the things we're worried about is he's repeating questions and asking for the same information, which makes us think maybe he has got a little bit of bruising to his brain. So we're still concerned about his head. Along with head injuries, Zoeb might well have damage to other parts of his body. The driver reported that he hit the car bonnet, the windscreen, and then the road. An orthopedic surgeon is checking him over. No pain in the elbow. No. Any pain here? A bit. Uh, I can't feel anything. It's numb, really. Any pain here? No. Any pain on when I do this? Where about? Uh, on top of it, really. Top of the knee. That's fine. Which x-rays did you want? Left shoulder, right hand and left knee. OK. Along with the additional x-rays, Anne is keen to get Soeb to the CT scanner so she can see what is happening okay. inside his head. chin on that little shelf. Yeah. We're going to the scanner. You. Yes, you did. Where? Hey, here. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. What's in here before? No, just today. I mean, a few minutes ago. I came and said hello. All right, all right. Just keep your chin on there. Yeah, perfect, OK. Right. Can you give us a hand in the scanner? Is that all right? Are you all right? Oh, you don't have to help us. Oh, OK. Slide. The CT scanner is one of the best investigative tools at Anne's disposal. He's moving all of his arms and legs, so I'm not worried about a spinal cord injury, but we want to make sure he hasn't got A, skull fractures, and B, to see if there's any bleeding inside his brain that's either causing pressure on the brain or that it's like a little bruise inside the brain. The images from this machine could reveal vital clues as to what is causing Soab's amnesia. If it is a bleed, it could save his life. Soab's had a big impact. He's been hit at 30 miles an hour. He's asking me the same questions and he doesn't recognise me. I'm worried that he has got a significant brain injury. Okay, we're done, thank you. Mm. Where? Here. Yeah. I think you might have seen me somewhere else. Have you been into hospital Fresh before? Behind you. You're not Is that sure? Anyone? I don't work at Newham, no. Royal London? Yes. Yeah, you're at the Royal London. Yeah. Anne won't know any more about Soeb's injuries until the results of the scans are back. Delta Alpha 77. OK, we're going to a shoot-in. The trauma doctors need to be prepared for anything. Tonight, Dr Gary We should see some ambulance parked here. ...has been called out to someone who has been shot. 500 metres, we're going to turn left. So that's going to be the RVP where the ambulance services are meeting, because we haven't had the scene declared safe yet. Yeah, here we go. So we're meeting uh, what we call a rendezvous point with the ambulance service, the police, because someone is alleged to have been shot. The police will have to go in first and declare that this scene is safe for us. So we're going to meet here and get some further instructions from the control room. So I'm just going to jump out and have a chat with this uh, paramedic. Still looking for it. Are they? Oh, yeah. OK. Steve, so we're at the RVP. The ambulance is here on Vassal Road. So we're just waiting the go ahead now, yeah, from the police. I don't think they've actually found the incident yet. What's happening at the moment is that the armed response police units are driving around to different addresses that they've been given for where this incident has happened. It's getting that time when you're not quite sometimes too warm, sometimes too cold. Over 2,700 incidents a year. Sometimes people uh, who have been shot will move from one address to another, so they have their uh, their, their incident at one address and perhaps they run away to another one and then report their injuries. I'm not quite sure what's going on behind the scenes, but there are people searching for us to get to the right place here. New RVP, Sydney Road, junction with Stockwell Park Crescent. If I'll spin it around, you want to follow me out? The trauma doctors venture into these potentially volatile situations to save lives. 
we're at a rendezvous point with non-armed response police officers who are looking to secure the scene. So we're always a little bit careful here um, because obviously, although we're with the police, we never assume that that makes us safe necessarily. Gareth has now been on the road for 27 minutes. Most important thing where someone's been seriously injured from a shooting is time. The longer it takes us to get to the address, the longer the clock is ticking for, which is not good when somebody's badly injured. So I'm hoping that the patient here isn't badly injured. If there's bleeding from any of the major organs, we would need to be there now to try and help with that and also to get the patient onto the hospital as quickly as possible. Delta Alpha 77. OK, thanks. Thanks. Thanks, Steve. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye. Nobody in interest. Nobody. Five. All right. Cool. Thank you very much. Cheers. So we've been told uh, by the police officers that this is a hoax call, which is a shame given the number of police resources and ambulance resources and so on that, that are here. It does make you angry because ambulances aren't ten a penny and there could be an old lady around the corner that needs someone who's lying on the floor. Um, so we try not to make judgments, but if you make a hoax call to the ambulance service, the risk is that one of your family might be the next one that doesn't get the ambulance or the, the doctor or the paramedic or the police officer that they need. Bonnet hit the windscreen. He's repeating questions. Oh. Yes, you did. Wasn't here before. I'm worried that he has got a significant brain injury. At the Royal London, it is just 47 minutes since Soeb was first admitted, and he is still confused and repetitive. When it comes to head injuries, we're trying to work out whether someone's behaviour is due to their head injury or whether it's due to their personality or the fact that they're just nervous they're in hospital and they've been injured. The CT scans of Soeb's neck and spine are ready for analysis. So I'm just looking at the CT scan carefully. There's a couple of bits on his cervical spine or his neck. I think they're probably old, but he's got a couple of little chips off some of the bones in his neck. He might have done something before. His spine looks fine, and his head does as well. I'm just going to have another look. This looks OK, which is great news for him. A tiny bruise or contusion can cause concussion. The good news is that the most worrying injuries, a bleed on the brain or a skull fracture, can be ruled out by the scans. He is still not quite right, though, um, so we're going to be keeping him in hospital tonight. We'll keep him on the a &E ward just to make sure everything settles down and that he feels better tomorrow morning. So now we're just going to wait for his x-rays of his shoulder and his knees and his hand to make sure we don't miss any um, minor injuries. It could have been a lot worse. I mean, if the driver was going at 30 miles per hour, 30 miles an hour is very fast for a car to hit a human body. And depending on which bit of you gets hit or which bit of the car you hit, um, you know, if it, it caught him on his side and he caught his spleen or his liver or something like that, it could have been a very different story. So, yeah, he is a lucky man. In a medical emergency, speed of response can be the difference between life and death. This is what the air ambulance is all about. The helicopter can be scrambled in a passenger wing. We want to be going up here. Gareth Davies is the senior medic on duty in the PRU today. Someone has called an ambulance. 
ambulance for a patient complaining of chest pain. Chest pain can be anything from a pulled muscle, having lifted something in an awkward fashion, to a full-blown heart attack. And there is a, a myriad of things in between that it could be. So it's not going to be the first left. I think it's going to be the second left. The worst case scenario would be a heart attack. The best scenario, it'll be something quite simple that we will be able to diagnose and reassure them. And we save an ambulance for uh, the next chest pain. It is a heart attack. Oh, there's a man on the chair there. I think I've seen the My patient. Side. With minimal information, Gareth will need to look for clues and investigate all the medical possibilities to identify and treat the problem. Hello. Oh, is he? Hello. Mustafa, Hello? who lives locally, collapsed Hi. in What's pain in the street and was ushered into this foyer Sorry? by a security guard. Mustafa, you're all right. Something blocked me. I can't move. I got problems within me. So, is is the main problem pain uh, in your back or your chest? My back. It's your back. Yeah. Can you just point to where it is? I can't. I can't you can't. Move my hand. Okay. Is but, it up here? Yeah. So, yeah. This area. This area. And this pain came on when you were walking. No, three days ago. Three days ago, and then it suddenly just got worse now, did it? Yeah, very worse now. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. The pain is just in his back. It suggests this isn't a heart attack. The way he seems to be stuck. We need to be sure this isn't a prolapsed disc. Prolapsed disc is an incredibly serious problem. If we don't get the diagnosis right, he could be paralyzed. And what about your arms and your legs? How do they feel? No, it's okay. They're okay, are they? No, no, my arm is okay. Look, I think what we need to do is we need to try and get you somewhere where I can look at you properly, OK? Do you want to have a look around? We need to get into a place where we can examine him properly and um, perhaps give him some pain, pain relief. What have you got? Let's we'll see if we can get him in there. So am I. Can you bend that elbow? Sorry, sorry, sorry. Can you bend that elbow? That's good. We just need to see your back, if that's all right. So this pain is here? No, no, that side. This side? Yeah, there and that. Here. Gareth is looking for clues as to whether this could be a prolapsed disc. Mustafa's complaining of back pain. There are problems with the spine have where a disc can suddenly rupture or move. Ow. Slip disc that can be a really big problem. It compress many of the nerves in the back the nerves to all of the legs and the bowel and the bladder start to be compromised and that can leave yeah. you paralyzed and incontinent. The muscles in the back are really, really tender and, yeah. and in spasm. That's what's giving him the pain, I think. The muscles are absolutely rigid like this. Listen, I'm going to put a quick trip in your hand here. I'm going to give you some strong painkillers. I want to try and get you in place where you can sit up properly. You can see he looks a little bit more relaxed All right. He's just pushed himself back in his chair now. Gareth needs to rule out both a prolapsed disc and a heart attack. Heart rate 93. I think that's because he's in pain. Are you happy with it? Yes, I'm yeah. happy. If Mustafa did have a heart attack, it may show up on the ECG. OK, this is good. No problems. You feel a bit woozy? Yeah. OK. So if it feels like a couple of pints of beer, it hitting the spot. Obviously, the, you know, the painkiller has several effects. Obviously, it takes away his pain, uh, but it also takes a degree of the anxiety around the pain away. When someone's in a lot of pain, they're not keen on ask, answering questions. When did you last have a, um, a wee when you went to the toilet? You've done that today? Yeah. No problem? No, no, it's OK, fine. OK. This is a good sign, as the bladder can stop working properly with a prolapsed disc. Gareth is confident this problem is purely muscular and nothing more sinister. So, it's this muscle here that was the problem. Yeah. And now it's, it was in spasm, but it's, it's out of spasm now. It's important with this problem that you move your back. Even though it's a bit sore, 
every hour, stretch it. It'll avoid this going back into to spasm. Mustafa, we've managed to keep out of hospital and save an ambulance. Rob has just walked him back to his house, which is, you know, I think a bit of a result, considering the man that you saw at the very beginning, where in normal circumstances that would have ended up in a, a 999 ambulance. Uh, he'd gone to hospital, waited in the emergency department, seen me if I was working, happened to be working there. You know, this way we've uh, avoided all of that waste. Within minutes of returning to the physician response vehicle, the next call comes in. Go ahead with details. Um, can't get off, must be dead. Roger, on the way. We've now been diverted off for someone that's believed to be in cardiac arrest, uh, which means their heart has stopped, um, which means we need to get there as quickly as possible. When someone's heart has stopped, you've effectively got about three or four minutes if the temperature of the patient is a normal body temperature. So we've got three or four minutes to get there and try and restore the pulse. Every uh, literal seconds after that, uh, the chances of recovery are uh, falling away dramatically. And not turn left Okay, here. go straight, go straight. Every second counts. Okay, this is our left. Okay. Getting a senior doctor with specialist equipment to a patient quickly can dramatically improve survival rates for cardiac arrests. It's good. Okay, here. Purple plus. Okay. Shall we not get involved? Yeah, Rod, thank you for that. And uh, when you speak to Charlie, say thank you. Okay. So we've just been stood down on the way to that job. Um, information from the crew on scene suggests that uh, the patient's been without a pulse, been dead for quite some time. So, and they're not trying to resuscitate the patient. about things like overdoses, strokes, Sorry. those sorts of things. We'll get much more information once the patient comes through the door. OK, let's get ready, guys. 54-year-old Emmerich works in patient transport. He has collapsed and fallen down unconscious whilst on duty. Okay. All right, sir. OK, OK. Right, what's happened, champs? He has been complaining to his crewmate all day that he had a headache. Right. And that his blood pressure was coming up. Then, subsequently, was taking an elderly patient off the back of the vehicle, and then he crumpled and collapsed onto the floor. Yeah. A small tremor in his left, left hand. Mm. When we got there, his GCS was still um, about three. It yeah. slowly came up to a seven. His eyes have been rolling in his head. OK. Emmerich, Mr Campbell. Mr Campbell, can you open your eyes for us? How are you doing, sir? You're in the hospital. We're going to look after you, all right? Well done. With the high blood pressure and the tremor, I wonder if this could be some sort of seizure or maybe an infection or a stroke. I need to do multiple investigations at the same time. Have we got a drip or...? Did you manage to get no, it? That's OK, I can do that. That's fine. No problem. So Mr Campbell seems to have a sudden event where he's collapsed to the ground. And interestingly, just before that, he was saying that he had a headache and that he was worried that his blood pressure had gone up, which is quite significant. 
The main thing that we're worried about here is that Mr. Campbell might have had a, a bleeding episode into his brain um, or a stroke. Emmerich's reported high blood pressure makes him a potential stroke risk. Whatever the cause, Gareth needs to get to the bottom of it fast. It's normal. We've had some blood tests back already, and that shows that all the salts in the blood and the haemoglobin level, uh, the sugar level, are all normal, which is good. But obviously, that doesn't give us anything to treat at the moment, so we're still keen to get into the CT scanner as soon as we can. 170 over 98, just high, but not too high. The blood test results suggest this isn't as well. an infection and isn't an overdose. Emmerich, however, is still deeply unconscious. If this is a stroke, <clears throat> Every second counts. If I check if the scanner's ready, yeah. we've got an unconscious person. Mm -hmm. Can't we going into the second scanner? Let's go. This needs to be done pretty quickly. The CT scanner, the ultimate diagnostic tool, will help Gareth so. to narrow down his search. OK, Mr Campbell. Mr Campbell, I'm just going to lie you down a little bit flat. Go. A stroke or a bleed on the brain can have catastrophic consequences if left untreated. OK, Mr Campbell, so nice and still for us. Well done. Level of consciousness has stayed very low, so I'm, I'm still very worried about that. Sometimes people can collapse like this after having a seizure, and then the level of consciousness is very low, but comes up quite quickly. But Mr Campbell's case, he's, he's remained more or less completely unconscious since he's been with us. check while we're here that we don't need to do a CTA. If this is a stroke, there could be some bleeding into his brain, or there could be a clot blocking one of the blood vessels. His level of consciousness still isn't right, though. This is a bit of a puzzle. The CT scan is complete, and the good news is that the patient has finally started to regain consciousness. Up. If I lift it, you just hold it. You ready? It is still a yeah, mystery it. why Emmerich was no, no, unconscious. Hold it there. And a no, neurologist no, no, no. Just, is checking hold it here. Him. Hold it there. Can you hold it? Okay. Mr. Campbell, can you feel it when I rub you here? Is that sore? W which pain is worse? Is it the back pain or the chest pain or the head pain? Which is the worse? <laughs> Where's the pain? Show me where it is. Where is it? In your back, which part of your back? Show me where it is. The chest one. Is this the worst pain? And what? And the back as well, okay. With his patient finally responding and conscious, Gareth can assess the all important scan results. If there is a clot on Emmerich's brain or bleeding inside his skull, these images will reveal it. And on a first look through the scan pictures, there isn't anything as, as catastrophic as we thought there might be. So we were thinking that there, there might have been some bleeding, and I can't see any bleeding. So it's quite good news that Mr Campbell hasn't had a bleed into his brain or a stroke. He's still not feeling very well, and he's still got a headache. So there are a few other tests that we need to do here. But it's unusual to be as sleepy as Mr. Campbell was when he came in. So I think what we have to do now is to put all the tests together, do some further x-rays, and then see if we can work out what this event was. But it's all a little bit unusual at the moment. from the ambulance service to say there's a 28 year old male. Hit the bonnet, hit the windscreen. I can't, I can't remember anything. He's repeating questions. What's in here for? You want to make sure he hasn't got skull fractures, um, but this okay, looks okay. Yeah. 30 miles an hour is very fast for a car to hit a human body. He is a lucky man. Have you been into hospital Fresh before? You. You're not is sure? I don't work at Newham, no. Soeb was hit by a car well, on his way to his yes. local cash point. That was three months ago. He still has no memory of the accident itself. 
all his first few hours at the hospital. The first thing I remember after having my consciousness is just seeing my friends beside them. The only question I was asking, uh, what happened, what happened, and uh, uh, I don't remember anything at all. The experience wasn't that bad uh, because the bed was comfy. Zoeb was discharged from hospital the day after his admittance. Both his scans and the x-rays were clear, so he was lucky to escape with bruising rather than anything more serious. Literally after 10 days, I had to go to my work. It was hard. Uh, the knee injuries were, uh, was affecting me a lot because you had to walk. The memories are fine. The knees got recovered as well. It's just the shoulders are still giving a bit of pain, uh, the left shoulder. The accident has certainly left its mark. The thing which has happened to me, uh, it could have been my last day. It could have been my last day, and so it's a awakening for me. So just wanted to take a step forward. The accident reminds me of that life is short, so you gotta do what you gotta do and what you plan for um, the moment you think of it. So you shouldn't wait. His plan now is to travel and see the world. Next month, we plan to go to see the Great Wall of China. I always wish to see the seven wonders of the world, really, every time. So uh, it, I think it's the time to start. Can you open your eyes for us? Mr. Campbell might have had a stroke or a seizure. We're going into the scanner. Let's go. This needs to be done quickly. No, 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 listen, hold it here. Can you hold it? Level of consciousness has stayed very low. is isn't anything as catastrophic as we thought there might be. A little bit unusual at the moment. He remains a bit of a mystery, actually. We were really worried about him when he, when he came in, and all the test results that have come back show that everything was normal. So he remains a bit of a mystery, and one of these people that's had a funny turn that we, we can't really explain. When he was first admitted to hospital, Emirate remained deeply unconscious for almost an hour before finally starting to respond. Emery. 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 First thing I could remember was I think I had someone calling my name. Emery. Emery. So nice and still for us. Well done. Mr. Campbell, can you feel it when I brought you here? Obviously, it was all a bit scary, but I was hearing some reassuring voices. Emrick, are you all right? Are you all right? Can you hear me? Can you hear me? Where's the pain? Show me where it is. I was feeling very disorientated. Show me where it is. I was thinking, is it how people feel when they die? You know, I was having all sorts of things, and I thought maybe I was... <sighs> At some point, I thought probably I was losing my mind because I was thinking, what am I doing here? What is this place? And what has happened? It is now three and a half months since Emmerich collapsed. And after numerous tests and scans, he has recently been given the medical all clear. I was in hospital for almost 10 days. I had all these monitors put in and there were 24 hour machines. And all these tests being done, there was no abnormalities detected which still leaves me, well, very uh, confused, but at the same time, I'm very thankful. I'm pleased to say that he's doing really well, actually. He's recovered fully, so we always try and give something a name, but unfortunately, you can't always find a name for all of the things that you want, and rather than making something up to make us feel better, sometimes it's better to say, didn't know what was going on, but we've ruled out all of the, all of the serious things. I definitely feel very, very lucky, making me more aware of the value of life and health. I'm trying to lose weight, not to eat much fatty foods, and um, try to go jogging and exercising. I think it's the way forward, because the health is the first thing. You can have money, you can have everything if you have poor health. I mean, you can never enjoy this thing, so. Um, I'm going to put that as a priority, to put my health first. In this case, things have worked out where we thought things were going to be quite bad, and they turned out to, to be okay, so we're, we're pleased in that case. 
you know, I've seen the way the nurses work, the ambulance team, the doctors, you know, and their, their love and, and compassion and devotion has really helped me not to take things for granted, you know, and obviously all these things cost money as well. So, I mean, I would like, you know, as a good citizen as well, to pay my own back to society. We're all very privileged to work for the service. It is the most amazing job in the world to think that we're able to help people who need us. And day after day, the work goes on. Someone's fallen underneath the train. You've been hit by a lorry. Uh, Since it was formed as a charity in 1989, London's Air Ambulance has carried out 28,000 life-saving missions. I'm lucky. Really good job, guys. Well done. The team should be really happy with that. My job is unique because we're on call for 20 million people. We're going to help you. For each year, around 2,000 desperately ill people are given the emergency treatment they need to survive. Red base, Delta Alpha 77 on the scene. Looks like it's got a break in it. I was scared. Every week, more lives are saved. Can I open your eyes? Pretty good, isn't it? You pop your head in there. Thank you so much, thank you. We're always trying to provide the best possible care for our patients. 